Welcome back to Aurora Tech Channel. Today, we're testing out the new filament dryer from Sunlu, the SP2. In terms of drying capacity, it can handle two one kilogram spools or a single larger spool of two kilograms, and it can even fit up to a three kilogram spool. For large spools, cardboard spools, or small spools that aren't suitable for the bearing rollers at the bottom, there's also the option to hang the spool using the integrated support rods. These rods also allow the filament to feed smoothly during printing. It's powered by a 200 watt PTC heater with a maximum temperature of up to 70 degrees Celsius. One unique feature of this dryer is that it's detachable. The bottom part functions as the heater with a vent where the hot air comes out and an inlet on the opposite side to keep the air circulating. To dry filament, simply attach the chamber to the dryer base and start the drying cycle. Once the filament is fully dried, you can detach the chamber and seal the bottom with the provided covers. With a hygrometer and desiccant inside, the chamber also serves as an airtight storage box. This means you can have multiple chambers as storage, while using just one heater base only when you need to dry filament again. The concept is straightforward and offers more versatility than traditional one-piece dryers. I'd like to thank Sunlu for sending us this unit and for sponsoring today's video. As always, even though this is a sponsored video, we won't hesitate to point out the cons of this machine. With that said, let's get started. I will divide this test into three parts. First, I'll check whether the device can reach its claim temperature. Second, I'll monitor its power consumption. Finally, I'll test a few different filaments under various conditions, such as brand new stored in a camera dry cabinet and moistened, and compare the print quality before and after using the dryer. Let's begin with the temperature test. I'll place a thermometer at the bottom of the dryer, a sensor at the top left where the hot air is blowing, and another sensor at the top right where the hot air does not blow directly. After starting the dryer, you can either select the filament type to use the recommended drying temperature and time, or manually set your own parameters. For this test, I'll set the target temperature to 70 degrees Celsius and leave the timer at its default setting. The room temperature was approximately 22 degrees Celsius. The two sensors placed on top of the hot air vent reached 60 degrees Celsius in about four minutes. The sensor in the middle, which is not directly exposed to the hot airflow, initially stayed around 40 degrees Celsius and reached 50 degrees Celsius after about eight minutes, with the humidity dropping to around 16%. After approximately 16 minutes, it reached 60 degrees Celsius and the humidity dropped to about 10%, while the two sensors above the vents maintained a temperature between 66 degrees Celsius and 68 degrees Celsius. After about 30 minutes, the middle sensor stabilized around 62 degrees Celsius, while the two above the vents continued to stay in the 66 degrees Celsius to 68 degrees Celsius range. I then repositioned two of the sensors, one at the hot air vent and the other at the air intake. After about an hour, the temperature at the hot air vent reached approximately 71 degrees Celsius to 72 degrees Celsius, and the intake vent measured around 64 degrees Celsius to 65 degrees Celsius. The area not exposed to direct airflow remained stable at around 62 degrees Celsius throughout the 90-minute test period. Overall, the temperature across different spots inside the chamber was well-balanced and stayed within an acceptable range of 62 degrees Celsius to 72 degrees Celsius when the target temperature was set to 70 degrees Celsius. For power consumption, when the machine is heating up to reach the target temperature, it runs at full power and draws up to 270 watts. Once it reaches the target temperature of 70 degrees Celsius, it draws between 60 watts and 180 watts to maintain that temperature. When the temperature drops about 2 degrees Celsius below the target, it begins heating again, repeating this cycle throughout the drying process. At a lower target temperature of 50 degrees Celsius, once the machine reaches the set temperature, it draws about 40 watts to 100 watts during the heating cycle. I also ran an 8-hour test and measured power consumption at different temperature settings with room temperature around 22 to 25 degrees Celsius. When the target temperature was set to 50 degrees Celsius, the total energy consumed after 8 hours was approximately 0.53 kilowatt hours, resulting in an average power consumption of about 66 watts. At 70 degrees Celsius, the total energy consumed was around 0.84 kilowatt hours, with an average power consumption of approximately 105 watts. Next, I'll test the actual performance of the dryer. Instead of soaking filament in water and drying it, which doesn't reflect typical use, I'll take a more realistic approach. First, 
I'll print a model using filament in normal condition, including brand new spools or those stored in airtight containers or a camera dry cabinet. In many parts of the world, especially in drier regions like California, humidity isn't high enough to require drying PLA before every print. However, this may not be the case for materials like TPU, nylon, and certain support filaments, which are much more sensitive to moisture. I'll begin with PLA. Most of my PLA is stored in a large plastic container with plenty of desiccant packs, maintaining humidity around 30%. I printed a Benchy using this PLA, and it came out pretty well, no major issues. If I saw this result under normal conditions, I wouldn't bother drying the filament. Then I dried the same PLA filament along with some TPU at 55 degrees Celsius for four hours and printed another Benchy. Can you tell the difference? The one on the left is the undried version, and honestly, the print quality is quite similar. After drying for four hours, the improvements are barely noticeable. So for PLA, if you store it properly or live in a region with humidity below 50%, you likely won't see significant benefits from drying. Now let's move on to TPU. My TPU spools are stored in a dry cabinet with the humidity set to 30%, and it seems to maintain that range quite well. I printed a TPU tire using this filament, and the result was pretty good. Just a tiny bit of stringing inside, but overall the surface quality was solid. Then I used the TPU that was previously dried with PLA. This print had very minor improvements on the surface, as the undried version wasn't bad to begin with, but the inside of the wheel was noticeably cleaner. There was virtually no stringing on the dried version. Next, I tested nylon, which I also store in the dry cabinet. Unlike PLA and TPU, which usually print well when stored properly, this nylon filament didn't perform as well. The print had some imperfections on the front, especially around the screw holes. The back showed inconsistent layer quality, and the Z-seam was the worst part, which is common for nylon. To see if I could improve this, I dried the same spool for 12 hours at 70 degrees Celsius, then reprinted the exact same model. This time, the screw holes looked cleaner, the layer consistency improved, and most noticeably, the Z-seam was much better. So even with good storage, nylon still benefits from drying for optimal results. When I tested the Bamboo Lab H2D a few weeks ago, I printed with PLA breakaway support, but the result wasn't ideal. The tree support failed because the filament was oozing and didn't adhere well to the support material. I had to switch to traditional supports to complete the print, but even then, there was filament residue all over the model, especially at small contact points where adhesion was weak. That was with a brand new spool, so I assumed the condition wasn't too bad, but clearly it still wasn't perfect. I then dried the support filament at 60 degrees Celsius for six hours, and reprinted the same model using the more challenging tree support. The difference was obvious, there was no filament residue falling off the model, the supports were easy to remove, and the bottom surface of the model was very clean. So, when it comes to support materials, using a dryer makes a huge difference, not just in surface quality or stringing, but in whether the print succeeds or fails. So far, all of my tests have used filament in relatively good condition. As expected, the impact of drying varies, sometimes it makes no difference, sometimes a small difference, and sometimes a significant difference, depending on the type of filament. But what if you live in a region with extremely high humidity? To simulate this, I used a sealed container with a bowl of water and a fan to circulate the moisture. I closed the box and left it for a week to allow the filament to absorb moisture. I then printed with the moistened version of each filament. The moistened PLA doesn't look too bad, just more stringing than usual. The moistened TPU looks much worse, with bubbles all over the surface. The moistened nylon is the worst. You can actually hear it sizzling like it's cooking. After that, I reprinted the same models using the dried filaments to see how well each type could be restored after drying. For PLA, the moistened filament produced noticeably poor results. However, after drying for six hours at 55 degrees Celsius, it regained decent print quality, almost like fresh filament. I didn't notice any significant decrease in quality after this moistened and redried cycle. 
TPU, the moistened filament printed terribly, but after six hours at 55 degrees Celsius, the quality bounced back. The print was nearly indistinguishable from one made with fresh, dry filament. Nylon. Moistened nylon also printed terribly, as it absorbs more moisture than most other filaments. After drying the moistened spool for 12 hours at 70 degrees Celsius, it almost fully recovered. The surface quality was comparable to fresh filament, although the Z-seam was still slightly less clean. Out of curiosity, I also tested an extreme case by soaking PLA in water for a full week. As expected, the print quality was significantly worse than filament exposed only to high humidity. After drying it at 55 degrees Celsius for 12 hours, the results improved noticeably, but still fell short of what you get with fresh filament. Prolonged soaking causes hydrolysis in PLA, breaking down the polymer chains and permanently compromising the material's structural integrity. This shows that while drying helps, there is a limit to how much damage can be reversed once the filament has absorbed too much moisture. Okay, let's talk about the pros and cons of this dryer, starting with the pros. First, it can actually reach its claim temperature. That might sound standard, but having tested many filament dryers from different brands, I can tell you that not all of them deliver on their temperature claims, especially those that advertise 70 degrees Celsius or higher. If you have one at home, try placing a thermometer inside. You might be surprised by the actual reading. Second, the chamber design is not only capable of drying or storing two spools at a time, but it can also accommodate larger spools, like two kilograms or three kilograms, as well as mini spools that often tip over when placed on roller-style spool holders. Third, the detachable chamber design allows you to use each unit as an airtight storage box. With a built-in desiccant compartment and hygrometer, it shows you when the filament needs drying again. This setup lets you own just one heater base while using multiple chambers to store as many spools as you need rather than buying several separate dryers. Now for the cons, the airtight covers are useful for sealing the chamber during storage, but when the unit is being used as a dryer, there's no dedicated space to store them. Since the top cover is thick and has some internal space, it would be better if it included two compartments to hold the covers so they don't get misplaced. Second, Although the detachable design is intended to let users dry filament with a single heater and store multiple spools in separate chambers, the current ordering options are limited. On the product page, I only saw a bundle that includes one extra chamber, and it must be purchased with filament. The reason appears to be that the chambers are not nestable, which makes shipping multiple units costly. To offset the dimensional shipping cost, bundling them with filament helps add actual weight to justify the volume. However, if the chambers were designed to be nestable, bundles such as one heater with four or more chambers could be offered without making the package excessively large or significantly increasing shipping costs. Third, the boxes are stackable, and for now, the bottoms of the airtight covers include anti-slip pads to help prevent sliding. However, the design would be even better with interlocking grooves or channels to make stacking more secure. Currently, the chamber includes a handle, but I think it would be more practical to use that space on the top cover for interlocking features and a compartment to store the airtight covers. After all, it would be hilarious to see someone carrying two of these and walking around. In conclusion, the detachable design and the ability to accommodate both large spools and mini spools make the SP2 dryer a versatile solution for filament drying, storage, and printing while drying. As shown in my tests, proper filament storage can significantly impact 3D printing quality. The Sunlu SP2 is now on pre-sale. If you're interested, you can find the link to the Sunlu website in the video description. Please also check out my website, auroratechchannel.com, which monitors the prices of major 3D printer brands to help you find great deals. That's it for this video. If you found this video helpful, please give it a like and consider subscribing to our channel. Thank you for watching and I will see you next time.